a transition from the medieval way of thinking to the new culture defined as humanism. On Wednesday, we are going to read and discuss a text, an excerpt from the first Machiavellian book, according to the plans that were laid out during the first week. And that will be for this week, Stanley Bing, what would Machiavelli do? The ends justify the meanness, which was a pretty successful little book from the year 2000. On Friday, I will resume my analysis of the examples that were offered during the first week and introduce new ideas about Machiavellianism and new examples to analyze. In particular, we will focus on con games or tricks and con artists and discuss whether or not a con artist is Machiavellian and whether or not a con can be considered a Machiavellian game, that is to say, something that repeats and confirms the laws of Machiavelli outside of the field of politics. And con games are a different kind of crime for a variety of reasons. The readings for this week will be the links that I posted will be online readings that I've already posted with the story of the knight, the dog and the snake from the book of the seven sages, a short canto from the divine comedy by Dante Alighieri, and in fact, not even the whole canto, but pretty much from uh, verse 70 until the end of the canto, which is around verse 140, 142 and a novella, the first novella of a famous collection from around 1350 called The Decameron by Giovanni Boccaccio. As I said, those readings can be accessed through links. No login is required. The first one is available on our class website or wiki. The other two are available. This one is at the University of Brown. This is a public site with ads, but uh, we, we couldn't do otherwise. It is a good translation of the Divine Comedy. It is free, uh, and the ads are, are not terribly uh, occupying too much space in the page or uh, interfering with the reading itself. Of course, you, uh, I recommend that you also review the notes you took during the classes this week. Of course, the other reading will be a short excerpt, excerpt from Wednesday's text, Stanley Bing, from Stanley Bing, What Would Machiavelli uh, Do? And either at the end of the week or next week, I will post the first short reflection paper, which will be analyze one of the cons that you find listed and linked in the class website and give me a sense of how Machiavellian this con can be considered following the model, the example of what we will do on Friday, okay? Again, even if I post it this Friday, it will not be due until the end of next week, okay? So it will be plenty of time for you to ask questions. For now, I will just tell the stories and offer brief commentary of each. And then I will show you what I posted, the points, the discussion points that I posted on the class website to expand our understanding. What we are interested in is the connection between a story that takes place in a specific context and universal truths and elements of knowledge that can be gathered from that particular story and how the relationship between the characters 
in a story, their understanding of reality, what they learned from their experiences, and the uh, universal laws of morality, of religion, of life are, and how those relationships change going from the end of the Middle Ages towards the period of humanism where, uh, when, when Machiavelli was born and that is the kind of education that he received. And in many ways we can consider Machiavelli himself a humanist. So in order to understand the particular treatment of evil situations, evil leaders, evil historical figures in Machiavelli and the way he excused them or the way he supported their practices or even praised their practices blaming the end of their victims on their stupidity, that can be understood better if we compare Machiavelli's thinking and approach to what was going on during the Middle Ages and how culture introduced changes, changes that moved in the direction of a Machiavellian system, okay? So I'll use the first story, I've taken this to be the first story because it is typical of medieval culture and medieval thinking. This collection of stories called the Book of Seven Sages, Il Libro dei Sette Savi, which is just the Italian version. And in fact, the author was considered anonymous up until a few years ago, and now there are uh, speculations and hypotheses about the possible, possible names for this author, but this collection is just the Italian version of a collection of stories that circulated in Europe and also in the Middle East and as far east as India. There are versions of, versions of this story in Sanskrit, in Farsi, in Hebrew, and it is quite possible that, in fact, the story originated somewhere between the Middle East and Southern Asia, and from there arrived in Europe. It is organized, as many other collections of stories, the Decameron is another excellent example, in that the 14 stories, the 14 short stories we found we find in this book are included in another story which is called cornice or frame story which again is not just typical of European collection of stories but you find that kind of structure adopted also in stories from the Middle East for example the thousand and one night the stories of Sherazad so in this case, the frame story that includes the story of the night, that frames the story of the night, is the following. There is a Roman emperor. He has a wife and a son. He loses his wife. He sends out the emperor, his son, whose name is Stefano, to be educated in the company of the seven sages, the seven wise men, or you might call them the seven philosophers of the title. This is a trope that you can understand very well because it is something that is repeated in modern fairy tales or uh, fantastic stories, the idea of the hero being educated in solitude by geniuses, by wizards who live like hermits is something, for example, that you find where, if you think of movies? No. King Arthur? I'm sorry? King Arthur? I, I could understand. King Arthur? King Arthur, yes. 
but in more modern, King Arthur is just a version of the medieval stories, but changing all the circumstances of the story, you find the same in science fiction movies, for Star example. Wars. Star Wars. Star Wars, right? Yoda would be that kind of hermit. So, Stefano is being sent away to become educated, to grow in wisdom and become more mature so that he will be able one day to take on the leadership of the empire. During his absence, which is protracted for more than 10 years, his father, the emperor, who's now a widower, marries again, and of course, he marries a younger, beautiful woman. This woman has never met Stefano. However, because Stefano never comes back to court, the idea is that he will come back only after he has completed his education. Only after the seven sages will tell him, now you're ready. And now you can go back and be what you're destined to be. So this young woman hears stories about Stefano, how beautiful he is, how uh, smart, intelligent he is, and endowed with all sorts of spiritual qualities as well. And she falls in love with him. This is a medieval trope called Amour de l'homme, which is a French Provençal expression, that is to say an expression from the French language spoken in southern France during the Middle Ages, that means love from afar. And it was considered to be the most noble expression of love, because you're not falling in love based on the physical attraction that you experience for someone else. You are falling in love with the spiritual side of a person who is extraordinary or excellent. So, finally, the day comes when the sages tell Stefano that he is ready to go back to court. And everyone is expecting this moment, right? His father has been waiting for, for so long. He wants to be reunited with his son. He wants to hug his son. And Stefano, who among other arts has studied astrology, he meditates about his return to court. And he reads into the stars that there is a tremendous risk, a threat that hangs over him. That when he goes back to court, he will be subjected to a trial that might have as an outcome his own demise, his own death. So he leaves the hermitage, but he's not happy. So his father comes out of the city of Rome to meet him, to greet him, to hug him, and he finds his son somber, not so happy, not so excited. So the relationship between the father and the son sours a bit right away. Stefano enters the court, is assigned a, a bedroom in the court, and the wife of the emperor, who was in love with him, goes into the bedroom to have sex with him. Finally, he's here so they can have a relationship. Stefano, having been educated in the virtues, of course refuses to engage in, in sexual activities with his stepmother and she says either you have sex with me or I will tear my clothes scream and tell everyone that you tried to rape me at that point Stefan doesn't say anything he just leaves the room and she goes on with her plan she screams tears her clothes and tells everyone that Stefano has tried to rape her so the father who was already perplexed by Stefano's behavior during their first encounter, has Stefano thrown to jail. And Stefano is to be executed. 
because of this heinous crime he committed against his stepmother. Of course, Stefano is still accompanied by the seven sages, by the seven wise men, the seven philosophers. So Stefano spends the night in jail, and the next morning, which would be the day of his execution, keep in mind again that Stefano has remained silent even in front of his father, has not defended himself from the accusations of his stepmother. So the next morning, the day Stefano is to be executed, the philosopher, one of the philosophers, goes to the emperor and says, take more time, think about this. It's a great decision, can have serious consequences, Take more time, and I will tell you a story that will help you reflect and take the best possible decision on your son. And of course, the, the, the emperor agrees. And the very first story that is being told by the first philosopher is the story of the knight, the dog, and the snake. After this story, the emperor will momentarily change his mind. However, the wife will also say, well, give me a chance to tell you a story and change your mind. Change your mind indirectly, let you reflect better on this. So for seven days, every day, one philosopher, one of these sages, will tell the emperor a story trying to save Stefano's life, and the wife of the emperor will tell a story to her husband, the emperor, trying to prove that Stefano is guilty and the decision to have him executed is the right decision to make in that situation. You can imagine what the end of the story is. As I said before, there are several versions, not only in various languages, Italian, Hebrew, Farsi, Sanskrit, but there are also different versions in Italian as well. The conclusion is pretty much always the same. The wife is eventually found guilty without Stefano ever accusing her. The truth comes out and she is herself killed and the uh, father and the son, the emperor and Stefano, reconnect and Stefano finally talks again and, and goes on to be a great leader. What is the night, the dog and the snake about? It's a very short story as you will see, typical of medieval fairy tales and stories in general. Printed, it's, it's on the class website, but printed it would probably be something like a couple of pages or a page and a half. <clears throat> it says that in Rome, there was a knight who had a dog, a greyhound, that he loved a lot. And he also had a young son, a, a baby, an infant. And of course, he loved this baby a lot as well. One day, the knight went out to see a tournament, a joust that took place in the city of Rome. And he left inside his house, which you can imagine to be a palace. He left there, of course, his son in the custody of the maids and his wife, the lady of the house. After the knight leaves the house, the lady of the house, the wife, and the maids go upstairs, go to a terrace to see the joust from afar. So they stay in the house, but they want to see this spectacle. At some point, downstairs, in the bedroom where the baby was left, a snake comes out of a crevice in the wall. You can imagine this stone palace with crevices that is common if you go to Italy to this day. So the snake comes out of this hole, attacks the baby. The dog 
however, is also downstairs. And the dog fights the snake trying to protect the baby. The, dogs, the dog kills the snake, and the end result of this fight is that everything is uh, chaotic in the bedroom. The cradle is upside down, the baby is under the cradle, out of sight. The dog is there with all this furniture uh, half destroyed, things everywhere, and blood on his head, because of course that is the blood of the snake. At some point, one of the maids comes out from the terrace where they were watching the joust into the bedroom to check on the baby. She cannot see the baby. She finds the dog there. She can see the blood on the dog's snout and she screams. She thinks the baby was killed by the dog. The screaming attracts the attention of the mother, the lady of the house. She wants to know what happened. The maid tells her, well, the dog, your husband's dog, attacked the baby, killed it, and the lady faints. At that moment, the knight comes back into the house and she finds all this commotion. The women of the house tell him what happened and they tell him, your dog, the dog you love so much, killed your son. He himself goes into the bedroom and sees the clues and misinterprets the clues there, the, the, the chaos, the uh, blood on the dog, and he has this spontaneous reaction, takes his sword, of course, he's a knight, so he has a sword, and kills the dog. Later on, reorganizing the bedroom, they find the baby under the cradle, they find the snake that the dog killed, and so they realize what happened. They realize that the dog had in fact saved the baby, and the knight is sorry for killing his best friend, the dog, when this dog saved the day, saved the baby, should have received a reward, okay? So it's clear how this is related to the situation, how this is suggestive that even in the case of Stefano and his accusation, the truth is different from how it seems. So, you know the context now, right? And the context of the story can be analyzed to extract some lessons, right? And, and the lessons, this is a medieval story, so the lessons are, are pretty, pretty direct. Uh, they're not difficult to extrapolate from this. So what are the ideas? What is the reader, not just the emperor who hears the story, but having a frame story is meant exactly to suggest that every story is educational and every story is supposed to be transformational because based on what you learn from a story, you may take decisions that will affect your life in deep ways. But what are the lessons that are clearly embedded in the story? Can you unpack some of them for me? Daniel? Uh, look at all the evidence before passing judgment. Yeah, yeah. You, you have to analyze the situation before, uh, carefully before you uh, uh, proceed doing something that cannot be undone, right? Such as killing the dog or having Stefano executed. What else? Because the story has a lot of players and you find a family and so, and you find servants, so the story is telling you more about society, about the relationship between genders, etc. What else can you extract, unpack from this short story? Any ideas? 
Yes. The innocent can be found guilty sometimes. Right. What else? So maybe the opposite of what she said, the guilty can be found innocent? Yes, of course. You can realize that whoever was believed to be guilty is in fact innocent. Yeah. Well, can you tell me about the relationship between men and women and the organization of the family, the organization of a house? Mm -hmm. What is the reaction that women have to an event such as this and what does it teach about men and women in the frame of medieval culture and ideology? Uh, Louis? Uh, it's oversimplified. They just have the, sermon, the maid scream and the wife faint. So because what kind of reaction is? Terrible. Uh, Sorry. Hysterical. Hysterical, yes, using the, the famous 19th century definition. It's emotional, it's physical, it's not rational, right? So, of course, from the frame story itself and the situation in which you find the female character of the wife, you know that there is a lot of misogyny in this story, right? In this collection and also in the story of the night. So women have an emotional side that is overdeveloped and they realize physically they're not inclined to analyze in a more logical, in a more systematic way. That's the premise of the story. What does the story tell you in terms of the relationship between husband and wife or the organization of a family and uh, the house itself. Uh, uh, remind me your name, sorry. Nigel. Nigel, thank yeah. you. But didn't the uh, husband that ever found uh, emotionally unwell, he immediately killed the dog? Yes, but why? Why? Exactly. So, he's he behaving like a man, he's behaving like a woman. And what is his fault? What is that he didn't do following what laws? He didn't investigate, but uh, more, more than that, what is the role of the husband and the role of the man of the house? What is it supposed to be in this kind of medieval framework? He's supposed to like, protect the house. Sorry? Protect the house. Protect, yeah, but what else? It's supposed to be like, like the logical one. Like... Yes, but I'm looking for something else. In terms of authority. The man is supposed to be the head of the house. Head of the house, the leader. The man is leading, the women are following. And the mistake made by the knight was not just to have the same kind of spontaneous emotional reaction. The mistake was that instead of be the leader in that situation, he was gregarious to the women. He followed their lead. They told him what had happened and what to do practically, right? They suggested indirectly what he should do, right? So the story within this context is sending you in all kinds of different directions, right? So about women and their emotional side about men and leadership and also about women and uh, we might call it authority because there is another basic problem right even before the night comes back there is a lack of proper leadership where can we find that what is the issue at stake with the lady of the house. How is she lacking in her leadership? Because she's the wife and the lady of the house. She faints, she faints immediately instead of... No, no, that's not the problem. That's her female nature. So it's to be expected. She had another shortcoming. She's not supposed, she's the lady of the house, right? She's an aristocrat. She's the wife 
of the night. So it's not exactly that she left the baby alone. The maid. The she, maid? She let the maid leave the baby alone. So her lack of leadership is found in the fact that instead of telling one of the maid, your role as a maid, as a subordinate in this house, is to stay with the baby and protect the baby and guard the baby. She let the maids enjoy the spectacle, enjoy the show of the jowls with her on the terrace. So she was un unaware of the pyramid of hierarchy in the house, where you find the maids, the lady of the house, the leader, the head of the house, the Lord, right? So she raised that hierarchy. She let the maids come upstairs with her to the terrace to the point where she said she implied that the maids could very well neglect their roles, their duties. So she made a mistake about that as well. And then, of course, the other direction in which the story is telling you, is sending you is what is the truth, how you get to the truth, and it's not just through emotional reactions, but a careful investigation. You have to take time, you can't react right away, especially when it comes to a decision that cannot be undone. Now, what I'm interested in, of course, is not the misogyny of the story or the dynamics of power in a couple, in a family, in a house of an aristocrat. But it's this very idea that you find a very specific context with very specific details, but the laws that apply to that context and can be extrapolated from that send you in all kinds of directions that are not context-specific, right? Because the assumption, the medieval assumption for the story is that all these laws apply to all kinds of contexts. That you can change the details and these laws remain true. That in every kind of situation, the man is supposed to be the leader, Women will behave emotionally more, more often than logically. Women may ignore the proper way of using authority and leading, etc. The truth always has to be found by taking time to investigate, applying your mind, etc. Right? So you have one specific story which is just the confirmation of universal laws about men and women, couples, marriages, families, uh, the, the organization of the house in a house where you have staff, etc. Okay, is, is that clear enough? So this is reflective of medieval culture in a way that will make us understand the innovations introduced by humanists and then by Machiavelli specifically applied in the field of politics. Okay, so I'm, I'm slowing down to answer questions if I left anything out or unclear or you want to express your opinion, comment on this, even outside of what I offered to your attention, okay? Shall I proceed? Okay. Let's examine the second story. This was from about 1280. Could be earlier for the previous versions of this collection of stories, where instead of the uh, emperor, you might find a sultan from the Middle East, right, etc. So we come to around 1308. During this time, a poet from Florence by the name of Dante Alighieri writes a long poem that can be considered the, summa, the summary of medieval culture. And 
exactly at the time when it was about to undergo, undergo a, a radical change. So in the Divine Comedy, in the first part of the Divine Comedy called Inferno, Hell, Canto V, we find a very famous episode about two characters named Paolo and Francesca, who are two lovers condemned to spend eternity in hell because they had an extramarital affair, they committed the sin of lust, they were killed by Francesca's husband, and therefore, because they were killed right after they sinned, they couldn't repent, they couldn't have a confession, right? They went straight to hell. The husband will go to hell as well, because the husband is a murderer, okay? Not, not, no excuse for him. In fact, the husband committed a worse sin, and the husband, they are found at the very beginning of this cave called Inferno. The husband will be much closer to the devil, who's found here at the center of the earth. Can he repent, though? I'm sorry? Can he repent? Hmm? Can he repent, or is that like, beyond the devil? Can you repent? Can he, couldn't the husband repent before he dies, or is that beyond oh, the devil? No, 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 because uh, murder is a mortal sin. You cannot repent. And the idea is also, you know, there might be circumstances and excuses to, uh, e even for an act of murder, but the medieval idea is also that the worse the sin you commit and the more difficult is to come back from it because it will harden your heart and make you worse than you were before. So it sets you on a path of sinning more and more. So you know, the husband, will die and go to hell himself as a murderer. In fact, not any kind of murderer, but someone who killed members of his family. Because Paolo was the husband's brother, and Francesca was his wife. So in the Divine Comedy, we find a character named Dante, who's the poet, right? He finds himself in the year 1300, near Jerusalem. Jerusalem be considered at the time the center of the northern hemisphere. And it is the center because of course it is the place where Jesus came to preach and then eventually died. He walks out of Jerusalem, finds a forest, you see, I made trees here, and in this forest, he cannot find his way out because he's confronted by three cruel animals, three beasts. So he finds the entrance to hell, which is supposed to be this cave. This is the surface of the earth. The earth is, is a ball, right? Uh, almost no one believed the earth was flat during the Middle Ages. That's, that's legend. Very few did. So the earth is this sphere, and under the crust of the earth, you find this cave shaped like a cone or a funnel. At the end, at the very center of the earth, you find the devil, Lucifer himself, stuck in, inside the planet. And you can walk around the edges of this cone-shaped cave. And there, Dante, during this mystical journey, will find the souls of famous people that are being punished in hell for their sins. And the closer you get to the devil, the worse the sin is. So last being here, being found at the beginning, is considered a lighter kind of sin. But it is still a mortal sin, meaning that can determine the death of the soul, the eternal condemnation of the soul. So, Dante arrives in this place where people who have sinned for love are being punished, and their punishment is being, being carried around by strong winds without ever stopping. This is their punishment, and it's an allegory of passion, right? They were carried by their passion in life, and this brought them to commit their sin of lust. In hell, it's a wind that carries them around and not 
ever been able to stop is their punishment, besides being in this dark place without God, etc. So Paolo and Francesca are together being carried around in this whirlwind. Dante requests permission, he has to ask permission from God to have them stop and talk to him. And he talks to Francesca. Paolo is by her side, but he never talks. It's Francesca who's doing the talking. And Dante, who probably knew the family of Francesca, Francesca was a historical figure, was a real woman, real aristocrat from the period, from before, from the 1280s. Dante talks to Francesca and asks her, how come you're here? Tell me your story. What brought you here to be condemned in hell? And Francesca explains that this was caused by passion, by love. I can read some of the verses that you will find online. This is the first of two speeches given by Francesca to Dante about herself. And she says, love, she begins her defense, her apology with the word love. Love, which in gentlest hearts will soonest bloom. Gentlest hearts in medieval culture means the hearts of the aristocrats, of the people who are nobles, and therefore they're not uh, madded by uh, the primary needs in life. They, they can develop their spirits, they can cultivate the, the highest forms of love. Love, which in gentlest hearts will soonest bloom, seized my lover, Paolo, with passion for that sweet body from which I was torn unshriven to my doom. Unshriven means without confession, without repentance. Love, again, which permits no loved one not to love, took me so strongly with delight in him that we are one in hell as we were above. Love, again for the third time, led us to one death. In the depths of hell, Caina waits for him who took our lives. Caina being a region in the lower levels of hell where people such as came from the Bible are being punished because not only were they murderers, but they killed a member of their family. What's their story? Francesca is married. The behind story is the following, which you gather not from Dante himself, but from the commentary. The people from the time knew about this story. And, and the commentators in the footnotes, so to speak, added their explanation. So this is the whole story. Francesca is married to an aristocrat who is Paolo's brother, who's the older brother and the political <laughs> leader in the family. A man by the name of Gianciotto, who is older than Paolo, uglier than Paolo, and has a physical disability. She's married by proxy, meaning that she's married before she leaves her own town. She's never seen Gianciotto. It's an arranged marriage. She comes to Paolo and Gianciotto's town, and of course, she is often in the presence of her brother-in-law, Paolo, who's younger, beautiful, educated. And one thing they do together, and this will be the second speech given to Dante when Dante says, tell me the details of your sin. And she says, well, one day we were together, Francesca with her brother-in-law, Paolo, and we were reading. Reading is an aristocratic pastime. They were reading a chivalric poem, the story of King Arthur's wife, Guinevere, and one of the knights of the round table, Lancelot. So already they're reading sinful literature because you have the wife of the king, the wife of King Arthur, who's flirting with one of the knights, Lancelot. They say, we were reading this story. Of course, at this point, 
they already are in love with each other. However, they don't know about each other's feelings. They haven't revealed what they feel to each other. However, they're reading this story. At some point, they read how Lancelot and the wife of King Arthur are kissing. At that point, their reaction to the kiss makes it clear to each other that they want to kiss, that they're in love. And of course, they commit a sin. Dante will, will not tell you more, but clearly they go on to have a sexual relationship. One day, they're caught by their husband when they're together sexually, and the reaction of the husband is to kill both. They, therefore, go to hell because they can repent, and the husband will also go to hell. So, Dante, the character who's also the author of the Divine Comedy, hears the story, and he really feels for, he really empathizes with Francesca. Because Francesca is someone he knows indirectly. He knew her family. She's noble. She's an aristocrat. She's a gentle soul. She speaks in a very convincing, persuasive way. She uses a language that is the, the poetic language of love. Or we would call it today, the, these days we would call it the romantic language of love. So. In many ways, Dante understands Francesca. He understands how someone can be carried by passion, especially somebody who got married not out of love, because it wasn't rich marriage, but someone who found herself in a situation where she got to know this other gentle soul who was powerful. And, and knew what love is, finally, right? So all of this is understandable, is justifiable or justified. However, these two are in hell. The very last line of the canto, the last verse of the episode, in Italian is the following. Caddi come corpo morto cade. I fell down, I fainted, like a dead body falls down. Why is Dante fainting? Because Dante has experienced this very strong contrast. On one side, he understands Francesca. He would like to excuse them. He would like to say, yes, I understand how this happened. It was not a terrible sin. It was not a mistake. It was something that was justifiable or justified. However, the other side of Dante knows, as a Christian intellectual, knows that God's laws cannot be violated, no matter what the circumstances. It doesn't matter that Francesca was in an arranged marriage with a man who was not physically attractive and maybe was also a rough kind of man compared to the more spiritual, more romantic power. It doesn't matter. There are no excuses in God's book. You committed a sin, you didn't repent, you go to hell. So Dante faints because these two sides cannot be reconciled, right? You cannot take Francesca's side and God's side. If you try to do that, then your mind has a short circuit. Your mind uh, explodes, so to speak. And that's how he faints. And then in the next canto, he wakes up and he continues on through hell and then from hell he, he will even see Satan and then from there he will find a passage, he will go to the other side of the war, world where he will find a tall mountain and that's the mountain of Purgatory on top of which originally the Garden of Eden was located and then from there he will fly like an angel to the planets, to the moon and the other planets, and finally, in heaven, he will see God himself, okay? So, what's the law that you extrapolate? What are the ideas, and I'll come to the end with this episode and let you go, but what's the laws that you can extrapolate from this? Again, you have an episode, right? 
you have this love story, the circumstances of the love story, right? And you can make a judgment based on those circumstances. But is the judgment rendered by Dante and by the Divine Comedy altogether based on the internal circumstances? And so you have Dante as an observer looking in and then saying, this is what I think. No. It is God himself. It is the Bible who affect the understanding of the episode, right? Once again, as in the first case, you have a specific context, specific characters, specific behaviors, but the laws surrounding the context are universal and cannot be modified based on the details inside the episode, right? It's always something outside the episode that affects our analysis, our understanding, and what we learn from the episode itself. We'll see later how this kind of approach changes radically with the first novella of this collection of 100 short stories called The Decameron from 1350, right at the edge in the transition period from the Middle Ages to humanism. For now, I'll stop here. Again, you find the links to all three stories. So between now and next Monday, do read them.